In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Steve Jobs, God rest his soul, Steve Jobs was the marketing genius behind Apple Computer Company. In introducing the first Apple computer to the market, Steve Jobs used a certain marketing ploy of sorts and had retailers price each of the first 200 units at this price, $666.66. An unusual price, to say the least. And when you combine this memorable price with the company symbol of not just an apple, but a fruit that has been bitten. One can sense just a little bit of rebellion there. It smells just a little bit like Jericho. Buying such a device, Mr. Job assured us, would give you the gnosis, would give you and tap you into the special knowledge and to true enlightenment. In last night's conference, I mentioned the Beatles. It's interesting that the record company they started back in the 1960s was named... Apple Records. Again, we have a fruit. The fruit often associated with the forbidden fruit of sorts as the company symbol. Yes, the Beatles, despite being baptized men too, being Catholic, they are truly icons and they are images of the revolution that we have mentioned so often during these last few days. Let me just mention one more point about this band, namely their very famous song and album, a revolutionary album truly, called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now, one of the lines from this musical piece is the following. It was 20 years ago today that Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. Who is this Sgt. Pepper that 20 years ago inspired the band to play? Well, if you count back... Exactly 20 years from the album's debut in 1967, you will find a year, 1947, that marks the death of Aleister Crowley, who happened to be a hero of the Beatles. In fact, a picture of Mr. Crowley shows up on the very front cover of the album in question. Mr. Crowley, for those who may not know, experimented with many illegal substances he was promiscuous in every imaginable way. He was a true libertine whose motto was, Do what thou wilt. That is the whole extent of the law. He was a magician. He was an astrologist. And he was also very much into the occult and into the black arts. And so it's not surprising then that Mr. Crowley was a mason. For the god of the masons is literally the devil himself. In fact, the hero of the Beatles, Mr. Crowley, was a full-blown Satanist. And he is writer of what is known as the Satanic Bible. It was 20 years ago today that Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. And what sort of inspiration did the band receive? The sons of God, the children of Seth, tradition tells us, were seeking to be faithful. They sought to stay on the mountain and to climb upwards even after being, having Adam and Eve kicked out of exile. They had vowed to stay upon the mountain to climb so that they might hear the song of the angels in the heavenly paradise above. But they began to hear music coming from the valley below and they started to look downwards. The music of the sons of Cain, the first murderer, it was so revolutionary. Their music was filled with volume, with disharmony, with discord, bass chords and notes, and yet it attracted those who dwelt upon the mountain. It appealed to their pride, to their sensuality, and to their greed. And so though they had sworn not to travel downwards, the sons of God, like many Catholics today in the Western world, went down the mountain to join in the revolution against God. Now, in addition to speaking about climbing up this mountain, which is so important to do, we have also mentioned over and over again the notion of this revolution. The revolution in the once Christian West that has overthrown 
the established order that God has willed with Christ as universal king and his Catholic church as his one and only kingdom. The revolution has brought nothing but disorder. But then again, that is the very nature of what a revolution is. It destroys the old order and puts chaos and confusion in its place. The revolution we speak of has a long history. It actually goes back to Lucifer himself, the greatest angel that God ever created. That angel sought a throne. He sought a place in the order of things that was not rightfully his. Lucifer coveted a throne, a throne that was at the right hand of the Father, the first seat under the most blessed trinity. Well, much to Lucifer's dismay, the highest throne in creation had been reserved for the sacred humanity of the Son of God and Son of Mary, Jesus Christ. And furthermore, Lucifer was told that he would not only have to adore and serve the God-man, Jesus, but also he would have to honor and serve and kneel before the mother of God, the humble virgin. She would occupy the throne right next to her son, unwilling to accept humbly the order which God had established. Lucifer cried out, non serviam, I will not serve. Other spirits, 33% in all, joined in this satanic revolution, and they devolved into demons. But two-thirds of the other angels, led by good St. Michael, stood tall for God and for his Christ in battle. They represent true Catholics because they are counter-revolutionaries, and all true Catholics are counter-revolutionaries. We know the result of the war from tradition and the Holy Bible. Satan and his traitorous companions fell like lightning from the sky, but they came down to the earth. The revolution is now here below, and men will either stay in Jericho with the revolution, whose end is only chaos and even hell, or they will be counter-revolutionaries fighting the evil, all while climbing the mountain towards the true new Jerusalem. We always have to ask each day of our life, whose side are we really on? For the revolution is largely in control of things. It has become the status quo. There's a great mystic, a Carmelite priest named Blessed Francis Palau. He had this vision of all the thrones of Western liberal republics, and he lived in the 19th century being under the control of Lucifer. The devil, the greatest of blasphemers, is becoming more cocky upon his earthly thrones. He offers the world to us if we would but bow before him and join in his revolt. From October of 1999 until January of 2000, an art exhibition was held in New York City, at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. It was the single most popular exhibition in that museum's history. Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people came to view the various displays, especially an image called the Holy Virgin Mary. This piece of art, if you could call it that, was done by a baptized Roman Catholic named Chris Ophely. It was and is one of the most offensive art pieces that has ever been displayed. And yet, in a city with millions of Catholics, there was hardly a peep. The work known as the Holy Virgin Mary shows a painting of the Madonna smeared with elephant dung. Instead of a halo surrounding her most blessed head, there are various images that from a distance look like holy angels, but up close are actually, actually images of reproductive organs. Both federal and state funding helped to bring this artist work to display. And very recently in the news, offensive photographs have been displayed in Catholic Ireland and in our own nation, depicting the Virgin in immodest swimwear 
with the image of Our Lady Guadalupe being the so-called artistic inspiration. The devil and his followers have a special hatred for this true counter-revolutionary, the Blessed Virgin. You see, a lot of salvation history is about this feud, this enemy relationship between Satan and Mary. In the very first holy book of the Bible, the book of Genesis chapter 3, the good Lord states that he will establish enmity between the serpent and the woman. And this feud will continue throughout all of salvation history to the very end. Because in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Holy Bible, chapter 12, there is mention once again of a woman clothed with the sun, with the crown of 12 stars around her head, with the moon under her feet, and she's being chased by a red dragon who seeks to devour her child and all of her spiritual children, the members of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. The devil's rage against this blessed mother is based upon her essential role in salvation history because of her free consent to be the mother of the Savior himself. The devil has been crushed, defeated by a woman. Well, the devil may be damned forever, but he still desires to get back at this woman, to show her disrespect and to bring her spiritual children away from her. In fact, insulting our Blessed Mother in her sacred images is one of the five blasphemies that are aimed at the Virgin. It demands reparation. On December 10th, 1925, Our Lady appeared to Sister Lucia of Fatima. Along with Our Lady was an apparition of the divine child Jesus, elevated on a glowing cloud. The Holy Virgin then showed Sister Lucia her immaculate heart. Her heart, though beautiful to behold, was encircled by very dark grayish thorns that were piercing that heart. And our dear Lord spoke to Sister Lucia, asking her to have compassion on the heart of his mother, which, quote, ungrateful men are piercing with thorns at every moment, and there is not one to make an act of reparation to remove them, unquote. The Virgin then spoke to Sister Lucia, stating that the thorns in her heart were actually the blasphemies shown by men towards her, and that she wished to be consoled by the practice of the five first Saturdays, where Catholics would confess their sins, receive the most blessed sacrament, recite the Holy Rosary, and would keep company with the Mother of God for a quarter of an hour, all while meditating upon the mysteries of the Holy Rosary. And if this were done, if this were done to help remove those thorns, these acts of reparation, in return for those who did that, Our Lady would be there for them in their last agony to help them with all the graces necessary for their salvation. Now, Sister Lucia, always eager, eager to begin this work of reparation, questioned our dear Lord about the purpose of five first Saturdays. Why five? In response, the Son of God stated the following, It is simple, my daughter. There are five types of offenses and blasphemies committed against the Immaculate Heart of my Mother, including blasphemies against her Immaculate Conception, blasphemies against her perpetual physical virginity, blasphemies against her divine maternity, and that she is the universal mother of all men. And yes, for blasphemies by those who seek to sow in the hearts of children contempt and hatred of the Virgin. And five, of course, those who insult her in her sacred images, her icons, her statues and paintings. Before there can be any peace in this world, before there can truly be a triumph of Mary's immaculate heart, those thorns have to be removed one after the other. Reparation must be done. These blasphemies, these offenses are also, as we have clearly heard, have also threatened mankind with the greatest punishments if they are not repaired. The work of reparation comes before any age of peace. Now, Brother Giles, 
was a companion of the great St. Francis of Assisi. And Brother Giles was most famous for being the great defender of Our Lady. In fact, when a number of individuals began to question and to mock and even scoff at Mary's perpetual physical virginity, Brother Giles flew into holy rage and he pounded the ground with his fist and he shouted three times, Mary was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ. And to the amazement of all that were gathered around, in the places where his fist met the ground, three lilies immediately appeared. Well, with the zeal for our blessed mother like Brother Giles, let us be about this work of making reparation, including consoling Mary's heart with the practices connected with those five Saturdays of five consecutive months. And with this work of reparation, perhaps we can also console the heart of our Lord and gently kiss his holy face. St. John Eudes, perhaps you know him in terms of his writings. St. John Hughes was a French priest of the 17th century, and he used to close all of his personal letters with the following, in the heart of Jesus and Mary, John Hughes. Note the use of the singular instead of the plural. In the heart of Jesus and Mary. This is not just a grammatical, this is not some sort of grammatical mistake. Rather, this priest is making a spiritual point. Namely, the heart of Jesus was and is present in the heart of Mary. That is the virtues of the heart of Christ. His love, His mercy, His meekness, His courage, His humility. They are also present in the immaculate heart of Mary. It is impossible to separate these two hearts. It would be easier to separate the sun from its heat or its light in the sky than to separate the heart of Christ from the heart of Mary. And does not St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest doctor of all in Holy Mother Church, doesn't he tell us and teach that the sacred flesh of Christ was formed by a drop of the most pure blood of Mary, which issued forth from her heart. The heart of Mary brought forth, literally, the heart of Christ. And that is why we should never, ever be afraid to approach Our Lady, for Mary has been fully transformed by the power of grace. She is, as it were, transparent. You can see right through her. It's not so much she who lives, but it is Christ living in her. Therefore, if you want to be meek and humble of heart, if you want and if we want our hearts to be made like unto Christ, and let us quickly and confidently go to Mary, for she has his heart to give us. And if you wish to reach the height of the mountain of God and to climb to see his holy face, then find the goal by journeying through the highest peak of all, which is the Virgin. Another French priest, and you should know this one for sure, I hope many are doing the consecration this coming Monday. Another French priest, namely St. Louis-Marie de Montfort, once made a very bold statement. Mary, he said, should be the very center of your spiritual life. The center of our spiritual life. Now, at first, this statement sounds almost unchristian. Even sounds blasphemous. For isn't Christ to be our central focus? Well, certainly St. Louis de Montfort would agree, but he insisted that Mary was the center insofar as she was the best means, the best way to the end, which is Christ. My goal, for example, is to travel to St. Louis. I'm probably going to have to travel through Columbia, Missouri. And if my goal is to go to Christ, then the best means of arriving there is through Mary. Hence, we have the famous spiritual phrase, which we should have in our lips and in our heart, Ad Jesum per Maria, to Jesus through Mary. Now the devil and his seed, they know this formula too, to Jesus through Mary. And in their wicked attempts to show irreverence and blasphemies towards our dear Lord, they will often mock and offend our blessed mother. They will attack Jesus through Mary. If you can stain the mother 
You can stain the sun, at least in the minds of men. If you deny or mark the fact that Mary was conceived without original sin in the womb of her mother, St. Anne, then you can bring insult to the sun. For the devil can claim that Mary was his before she was Christ's. The blasphemy is connected with denying or mocking Mary's perpetual physical virginity before, during, and after the birth of Christ ends up being infinitely offensive to the Son of God, who prophets have told us was to be conceived and born of a physical virgin, and he was to be the only begotten son of Mary as Isaac was the sole promised son of Abraham. And, of course, questioning or insulting her divine maternity ends up casting doubt on the very divinity of Christ, which is the foundation of our holy religion. Any public irreverence shown towards Mary, any public contempt or scorn shown towards the mother passes on to the son. Such evil is not only outright blasphemy, but it also corrupts the minds and the hearts of the young. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, before there can be a triumph of Mary's immaculate heart, before there can be an age of peace and a universal reestablishment of the Christian order, which is prophesied, reparation for these crimes must be done. Thorns in Mary's immaculate heart must be removed. His universal reign of peace in the minds, hearts, in the public societies of all men. That is truly the triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart when Christ is recognized as Lord and King of all. His gospel being the law of our hearts and of our nations. Heart of Jesus, may your kingdom come and may it come through Mary. Or as St. Louis de Montfort once put it, it was through the Most Holy Virgin that Jesus came into the world and it is also through her that he has to reign in the world. Most of mankind, we know this, most of mankind is on the edge of the abyss of hell, near Jericho, the lowest city on earth. Like Bartimaeus, the blind beggar in Jericho, modern man is spiritually impoverished. The smokescreen of secularism, the fog of liberalism, the haze and smog of modernism, it hides the mountain of God from our modern eyes. Therefore, men of the modern age are becoming ever more base, ever more bestial as they dwell in the valley near the pit. Modern man is not evolving. He's devolving. Men are becoming more cruel. We're becoming more violent. We're becoming more disordered. And for those modern men who do seek elevation, who want further enlightenment, they often seek man-made means and various tower babbles and false summits in order to achieve it. Or to paraphrase the great journalist G.K. Chesterton, it's not that modern man doesn't believe in anything. It's the fact that modern man will believe in anything. He'll climb every mountain but Mount Calvary. Let me give you an example. Shirley MacLaine. You all know her, I think. Shirley MacLaine was born in the 1930s, grew up in a Christian home. Of course, Ms. MacLaine is famous for being an Academy Award actress. But perhaps today she's best known for her New Age spirituality, climbing false mountains. She seeks to further enlighten herself and her mind so that she can become the God that she already is. Presently, she lives in the mountains of New Mexico. For as she puts it, that location in the mountains allows her to better channel the energy forces of the cosmos so that she can be in harmony with the God that is all of creation. In her journey to divinity, Ms. McLean often consults various Far Eastern gurus, she also consults extraterrestrial beings from their UFOs. McLean also believes in reincarnation. In fact, when Miss McLean gave birth to her only daughter, she remarked, when the, daughter brought, when, when the doctor brought my child to me in my hospital bed, 
I wondered if my daughter had lived many lives before with other mothers. Had she, in fact, ever been a mother herself? Had she, in fact, ever been my mother? Was her one-hour-old face perhaps millions and millions of years old? The New Age movement, unfortunately, is gaining more and more ground in the Western world. You see, when men throw out Almighty God, when they throw Him out of their lives, something else will take His place. Nature and supernature abhors a vacuum. Human beings are spiritual creatures that need spirituality. And if Christianity is rejected, then something will be accepted in its place, even if it's ridiculous. In New Age spirituality, there's no personal God, but rather some sort of divine force, a divine energy out there that can be used for good or for bad. Ultimately, for the New Ager, God is not the supreme being that is ultimately transcendent, but rather all is God. Man is God, animals are God, stars and planets are God. And it's called the New Age Movement because of their belief that there is to come a new age, a new period in history that is about to begin the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This will bring about supposedly the true enlightenment of human minds. Using astrology, using crystals, using aliens, using genies, using gurus, using mediums, using witches, and even demons as channeling devices. Men will reach their true potential as divine beings without the Holy Trinity being involved at all. Of course, man doesn't need a savior in such a system because, well, there is no such thing as sin. There's no immorality. There's no heaven. There's no hell. But all is rather a series of reincarnations until one reaches total union with the universe or nirvana. Men wanting to become gods, wanting to become divine without the involvement of the divine himself, God himself, has been a problem since the beginning of the human race. You see, human beings all want to be happy. It's true. Human beings do want something good, the highest good in fact, but we often go about it the very wrong way. To be gods, to be godly, is a good goal. But human beings often use the wrong means to achieve this goal. Almighty God, the Most Holy Trinity, the Supreme Being that is totally beyond this creation, does wish to make us gods. He wishes to be intimate, spiritually. Almighty God, the Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost wish to bring us into their divine communion, their godly fellowship. The good Lord wishes to give us a share in His divinity, that state of grace. He wishes to give us eternal glory in heaven with the angels. But God demands that we attain this goal His way. Human beings are creatures who are infinitely below the Creator, and we cannot come to perfection. We cannot become godly without Him. We are nothing of ourselves. We are creatures of clay. We are come from the dust, from the mud and slime of the earth. We are totally dependent upon the good Lord. Before I close, let's go back to the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, the serpent spoke to Eve. The devil's temptation is perfect. He turns to the woman suggesting that if she eats the forbidden fruit... She will not die. She will become a god. Notice the devil offers Eve a good thing, a good end, becoming godly, but going about it the wrong way by breaking God's commandment. In their sin, Adam and Eve wish to bring themselves by their own devices to the heights of perfection instead of relying upon the Creator. Our first parents sought self-direction instead of God's direction. God had made Adam and Eve immortal beings. He created them in grace. They were godly. They were immaculate. They were filled with divine knowledge. And they were the stewards of a creation that served them 
in perfect subjection. Thrones had been prepared for them and for all their children in heaven. But the pride of our first parents, their disobedience caused them to fall from the heights, to lose their grace, their share in divinity, to lose paradise, and to gain exile in a world of sin, suffering, disease, and death. Adam went from Jerusalem to Jericho in an instant. But then came the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan came from the heights of Jerusalem to the depths of our Jericho. The Son of God came. He came down to rescue us from the power of sin and death, to bring us back to the divine communion we had with Him in the beginning. And he took all of us, all of humanity and our sins upon his shoulders, and he went up the mountain of Calvary. We don't believe in reincarnation. It is a ridiculous notion, because man is body and soul, is a body-soul composite. Rather, we believe in the incarnation, the mystery of God becoming man in Mary's womb. Many saints have said the following phrase, and it's not an overstatement. Many saints have said, God became man in order to make men gods. The Almighty has always willed to unite himself with us so that we can share in his life the fellowship that he has within the Trinity with all of us. And if we sought this goal in a sinful way, The Son of God now mercifully forgives us. And He offers us this divine life anew. It's as if God states, I will become like you in order that you can become like me. I will share in your humanity in order that you can share in my divinity. Christ our Savior offers us the only new age. It's in Him. For in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. In Christ, there is a new beginning. In Christ, there's a new creation. In Christ, there's a dawning of a new age where men see their full potential of uniting with Christ, the new Adam, the divine Son of God. But in this new age, Almighty God demands that once again we seek perfection in total dependence and subjection to Him. That we seek it His way. That we go up the mountain of the Catholic Church which He gave us. We're not going to build towers of Babel. We're not going to go up false summits. We're going to follow Catholic tradition. We're going to use His means. His ways to attain godliness including the channel that he has established. We're not going to use gurus, not aliens, not crystals. We're going to use his mother, for she will bring us to the fullness of Christ. In Mary's womb, if you think about it, not only did God become man, but a man became God. In Mary's womb, heaven and earth were united God and man were wedded as one. Jericho is lifted to the heights of Jerusalem. If we truly wish to become divine, to realize a dream beyond our imagining, to enter into the family of God, to converse with heavenly beings, to become holy and even sinless, to have angels serve us, to go up a mountain far higher than that of Mount Olympus, to be godly, then come to Mary. Come into her spiritual arms. Come into her spiritual womb. For she is that divine channel. She is that channeling device that brought God down to earth and will lift men to heaven. In her, God becomes man and men become godly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our reading from 
the book of Moses, the book of Exodus. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose out men and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill, having the rod of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had spoken, and he fought against Amalek. But Moses and Aaron and Hur went up upon the top of the hill. And when Moses lifted up his hands, Israel overcame. But if he let them down a little, Amalek overcame. And Moses' hands were heavy, so they took a stone and put under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands on both sides. And it came to pass that, uh, that his hands were not weary until sunset. And Joshua put Amalek and his people to flight by the edge of the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and deliver it to the ears of Joshua, for I will destroy the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name thereof the Lord my exaltation, saying, Because the hand of the throne of the Lord and the war of the Lord shall be against Amalek from generation to generation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the Apocalypse of St. John, last book of the Bible, we read the following passage about the church in Ephesus. Very important for us here tonight. Thou hast patience and hast endured for not my name and has not fainted. But I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first charity. Be mindful, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and do penance and do the first works or else I come to thee and will move thy candlestick out of its place except thou do penance. The Apocalypse, chapter 2, message to the Ephesians. Well, this warning is something that we should take seriously at the close of a mission. We know about the mountain of God. We've laid it out. We know it's possible to climb, and I hope that you desire to climb and that you want to climb, seeking the face of God and making reparation to the holy face and doing penance to mitigate the evil of our times. Alas, however, how easy it is for these good in desires, good intentions to grow cold in the environment in which we live. This cooling of charity at Ephesus therefore pertains to us too. It is a concern we all should share. What can we do? In other words, this could be us. This could be our candlestick being moved from its place. Well, the basic answer to all the difficulties we face is the same. Charity. Love is the solution to all problems because St. John says God is love. And so love will solve all our problems. I don't care what your problem is. It will solve it. If we're open, if we're willing to use it, Charity, then, is our weapon. I'm not talking about huggy, kissy, lovey charity. I'm talking about manly, godly charity. Charity that helps a man, moves a man to lay down his life. Charity is our weapon. The more we love God, the more we will want to climb and be with Him. Love wants to unite the lover and the beloved. The more we love God, the more we will love our neighbor. The more we love our neighbor, the less we will love ourselves. Self-love will die. The less we love ourselves, the more we're willing to make sacrifices and do penance and to have our hands dripping with that myrrh we spoke of last night. Myrrh that is able to open doors and respond to God's graces when He calls. And so that we'll get grace upon grace upon grace to climb and keep climbing the mountain of God. Yet, due to our self-love and our fallen human nature, let's face facts, sacrifice is usually difficult and irksome. Only love can make it easy. 
And perfect love can make it a joy. We are willing to give in proportion as we love. When love is perfect and the sacrifice is complete, we have reached Calvary. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and the Son so loved us that He gave Himself for our salvation, as we know. Greater love than this hath no man, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Here then is our answer. Here is our answer. If we want to avoid our love growing cold, we must make sacrifice. But this is not easy for our poor human nature, our poor fallen nature. In these times most perilous, in which we are still living, and most of us are living below sea level in the smog of Jericho, we're easily influenced by this smog. We don't see why we need to do these things so readily. And the noise that's all around us that's bellowing out of Jericho is constantly confusing us. There's that diabolical disorientation we've spoken of. So God knows this, and so He provides a solution. He will provide a way for us to be drawn up toward Him. He will draw us with the bands of love, a way that can be irresistible if it's properly received. Did not our Lord say as much? He said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. When I am lifted up, he draws us to himself. Love unites the lover and the beloved. And our Savior does this from the cross. Once again, we must look up for all our answers. And he's up on the cross Drawing us. So how does our Lord draw all men to himself? The answer is simple. Through the holy sacrifice of the mass. That's the answer. Notice that the high altar is set on a little hill. We have to go up to the altar of God. It's on steps. So keep in mind that churches are built for and around the altar. This is the most important thing in our church. It's all about this altar. This is very appropriate because after the second consecration, something deeply mysterious happens at Mass. And that's why at the second consecration, there's a special word that's there, mysterium fidei, the mystery of faith. And what happens at the second consecration? What is this mystery of faith? Well, two windows go up at Mass. Two windows. Mass is is got a timeless moment, using fancy words. It's got a chirotic moment. Timelessness. At the second consecration, windows open up. Windows to what, Father? There's two windows. One opens to Calvary and one opens to heaven. This is why in the words after the consecration, We'll hear about how we pray in the canon that the altar here on earth will be united with that altar in heaven. They are united. And the priest is in a unique position where he is so close to God and the altar in heaven. The altar is Christ that he gets to kiss him. If you were that close to Jesus, wouldn't you want to kiss him? And so he kisses the altar at that spot in the, in the mass. Showing his love, his unity with the Lord. But since there's two windows, that means there's two ways we can keep our love alive. From growing cold through the mass. Now it's best to think of these two windows as being in a row, not side by side. You don't take your choice. Oh, I'm going to think about Calvary at this mass or I'm going to think about heaven they're in front of each other. One's behind the other, okay? So the first window, the front one, that's Calvary. The back window, that's heaven. So this means that all the light and grace of heaven is bursting forth. Heaven is a sea of love as we've been singing in that opening hymn. Heaven is light, beauty and glory, and it's flowing down. But there's Calvary in front of it. So if we saw with our own eyes what happens at Mass, 
we would see Calvary silhouetted in the light of heaven. That's what we would see. Very important image for us to keep in mind when we attend Mass. So it's as it were that it's saying to us, here is how you enter into eternal love, eternal life through Calvary. But it's more than that. It draws us up by sending down graces to those that are on the mountain in the shape of a cross. All the graces that come down the mountain are in the shape of a cross. And we could go on for a couple of conferences on what that shape is. But it's always trying to get us to die to ourselves and to be united with our end, which is Christ on the cross, so that we can go ultimately to the ultimate end, which is heaven. So it's drawing us up by sending us down graces in the shape of a cross, saying, be conformed to Christ crucified and he will draw you to himself. So we see by faith that our goal is at, is at every mass. It's present. So we can taste it. Hope is invigorated such that we know the summit is possible and all the means are necessary to reach it. We know it at every mass. Love is ignited anew, especially with Holy Communion, to desire the summit. Let's take an example. This is an Old Testament type. Elias, St. Elias, the great prophet, he's going through a very frustrating time in his life. He's just defeated 450 prophets at Baal. He's freed the country from these wicked men. But Jezebel's still alive and she tries to kill him, tries to seek his life and he has to flee and he goes into the desert. He goes beneath a tree. He's upset. He goes beneath a tree which symbolizes the cross. He goes to Mass. And then he prays for death. Take my life, Lord. I'm no better than my father's. And then the Lord comes through his angel and says, eat this, okay? He eats it and he goes to sleep because he's not happy and he's sad and he goes to sleep. Angel comes and wakes him again, takes another, take, eat this. So there's two, he takes two communions as it were because there's two natures in Christ. Here, you're going to need both of these. Body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So he takes the communion. All of a sudden he's invigorated beneath that tree. And he climbs the mountain of God without hesitation, passing through 40 days and 40 nights of desert and goes to the Mount Horeb. And what does he do there? He speaks intimately with God. Face to face, as it were, as if he were already in heaven. And from that point on, Elias was fine and did great things. And as we know, he went up into heaven in a flaming chariot. So, in the silhouette of Calvary, all the graces of heaven come down to us in the shape of a cross, through him, with him, and in him, beckoning us to come up here. Join me. Don't be afraid. Note that this is also true of the souls in purgatory. They too are exposed to Calvary. They too are being crucified and drawn to heaven through exposure to the mass. So I encourage you, Always have many masses offered for the poor souls in purgatory. They need those graces too to be crucified. Now, to see this truth that I've just passed on to you using an Old Testament scriptural image, an Old Testament type, let us now consider the 22nd chapter of the book of Joshua. In the book of Joshua, there were certain tribes that decided that they were not going to live in the promised land. They were going to live just outside on the other side of the Jordan. Who are these? Well, they're the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, they decided to build an altar at the foot of the mountain because they realized, actually, this altar was near Jericho, matter of fact, because they realized that their charity would grow cold. They wanted a way to keep their charity alive down there. And so they set up this altar. But this upset the other tribes of Israel. They were angry. Why would they be angry? Because there's only one sacrifice. It can only be offered on one altar. There's only one altar. So they were upset that they built another altar. Let's translate that into the New Testament. 
There's only one sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ on the cross. And as Catholics, through the priest, this one sacrifice is made present again on all our altars throughout time. In each mass. Now, it seems to me that this truth is what is being typified, is being prefigured in the 22nd chapter of Joshua. Now, the Israelites threatened war against those who conducted the or constructed the altar down by the Jordan. They're not happy about it. So they started to gather together and go down and fight them. Those in the valley were concerned that they would not be included. So they explained this. They would not be included in the true sacrifice up on the hill. So they explain this to these warlike Israelites getting ready for battle. Wait a minute. Don't come down. We're we're not doing anything wrong here. Don't hurt us. And so they explain that once again, they wanted to be included in the one sacrifice taking place at the top of the mountain and consequently so that they would not risk losing their salvation. They wanted to make sure they had a connection, in other words. I hope you see what I'm getting at here. They built an altar at the foot of the mountain that would connect them spiritually, mystically to the altar that's on the top. That's what they were doing. They did not make any bloody sacrifices upon this altar. And thus, the Israelites let them go. They understood, okay, all right, okay, you're, you can, this isn't bad as we thought. Now let's translate this. This is the same as the Mass, which is the unbloody representation of the sacrifice of Jesus. It's offered down in the valley of this world so that those climbing can get into contact with that one sacrifice. So we're down here. We need to get up there. We have a way to at least get in touch with it regularly to remember this is what I'm all about. This is where I'm heading. We need to taste the end of the journey. We need to be exposed to the end. So our charity will not grow cold. We must die with Christ if we're going to rise with Christ. The best place to die with Christ daily is at the Mass, at the consecration. Now we can consider the scene from Exodus that we read earlier. Now we can see that there's something here for us as well. Moses with his wooden staff represents Christ crucified on the mountain, does he not? Joshua's down in the valleys fighting the Amalekites. Moses has got a wooden staff. That's the cross. That's the cross. That's Calvary. This is why he's on a mountaintop and has to have his hands in the shape of a cross. By the way, this is one of the reasons why, at least is my understanding, you can think about it spiritually, why the priest is wearing a maniple. Why does he have to have that maniple on? Because he needs to keep his hands up like Moses did because we're in battle. So it's as it were screaming out to the priest, get your hands up, get your hands up. We're in battle. Don't let them down. Because when Moses lifted up his hands, Israel overcame. But if he let them down a little, Father, get that hand up. Amalek overcame if he let it down. So the maniple is a constant reminder that the priest is an intercessor and he's like Moses on this mountain of the high altar, keeping his hands up in prayer. Now note that Moses held his staff at all times, the mighty works and wonders. We know that the Red Sea was spread, had the, had the staff. Everything he did, he had to have that staff, that wood staff. That's the cross. It's saying that in this sign you shall conquer, which was the sign given to Constantine. In hoc signo vinces, in this sign you shall conquer. It's only in the sign of the cross that all these wonderful things will take place. That's what that means. That's why it's wood. That's why it's a staff. So it's as it were in this sign your love shall not grow cold. Now, the Amalekites, they represent anything that's blocking our way to the promised land of heaven. Temptations, physical ailments, difficult people, miscommunications, devils, disasters, malicious revolutionary men and their ideologies which are rising all over the place. Is that, are you going to let that get between you and heaven? 
Well, Joshua down in the valley represents Jesus. He comes down among us. Now, if we pray and participate in Mass rightly, our Lord will come down into the very midst of ourselves and all our troubles, and He will put Amalek and his people to flight by the edge of the sword. The sword that comes forth from his mouth As we read in the book of the Apocalypse, out of his mouth proceedeth a sharp two-edged sword, and with that he may strike the nations and slay his enemies. For no word will be impossible for God. So are we struggling? Are we frustrated? Is there Amalekites attacking us? Hey, listen. The Mass is being offered somewhere. Tap into it. You got sacramental character that comes with baptism. You have a right to tap into any mass going on in the world. You just unite yourself to it. It's amazing the power a Catholic has. Few of us use it. So call upon Moses on the mountain with his arms outstretched. Somewhere in the world at this very moment, Moses is on the mountain. His hands are outstretched. And beg him, send Joshua, Lord, I need him. And he will come. Unite yourself with the masses being offered and make a spiritual communion and charity will not grow cold and you will have an unconquerable weapon. This is how to make a a spiritual communion. Say to yourself or say to God, Lord, I know you're going into soul somewhere in the world today. Mass, come into me now. I need you. As you're going into them, please come to me too. Or say it like this. Lord, as you come to me at Mass, would you come to me now? Your charity will not grow cold. Furthermore, consider that Moses sat on a rock which symbolizes the altar in the Mass. After the battle was over, the Lord told Moses, write this for a memorial on a book, in a book and deliver it to the ears of Joshua. For I will destroy the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Now, how is this blotting out to be done? Well, Moses built an altar in that place, saying prophetically, quote, The war of the Lord shall be against Amalek from generation to generation. End quote. So we're still at war with Amalek. Yet we have the means to win in the altar of the Mass. And this Mass is given to us until the end of time. And the Antichrist will only gain ascendancy when he can suppress the Mass. That's what's holding him back. This is our weapon. Are we using it rightly? If rightly, the Amalekites will be mowed down. Otherwise... They will have the better of the fight. If, however, we don't use it rightly, now how can we misuse the mass? We forget that it's about Moses putting his arms out. And we let his arms drop. And I just go into mass because I want Holy Communion. I don't want to sacrifice anything. Now remember, mass is a sacrifice. So if we just go to mass to get Holy Communion, that's all we're going for then Moses' arms are dropped. You're not going to win against those Amalekites in that manner. You can go to communion every single Mass and you're going to fall and you're going to fall and you're going to fall. You bring your sacrifices. You unite your sacrifices. You make your life a sacrifice. And that communion will come to you and Jesus will rout Amalekites out of your heart and out of your life. Heaven is selfless. Offering of self is a taste of heaven. Offering of self to God. Not what's in it for me. That's sacrifice. Offering ourself to God. And then the fruits of that come forth in communion. The arms of Moses remain up and we have the better to the fight. So the graces coming forth from the mass are in the shape of a cross. You want to keep your charity alive? Keep that first window in mind. I must make sacrifice. Okay, that's number one. That's the first window. What about the second window? I mentioned there were two solutions to keeping our charity alive. There's another window, and that's the window to heaven. Now let's go to St. John of the Cross. He's going to come to our aid. He would have us go straight into heaven when we're struggling with something. 
He wants us to go right into that second window. This is an amazing thing he presents. Now, if you recall, the children of Fatima, remember, they, as it were, went right straight to heaven through Our Lady's gift of those rays flowing from her hands. These little children saw themselves in God and God in themselves, and they were, as it were, already in heaven. And nothing was impossible for those little children. Great sacrifices were possible. They looked up all the time. Okay, let's go to John of the Cross. How can we get into heaven? Let's listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. He says, there are two ways of resisting vices and acquiring virtues, overcoming all trials in this life. Okay. The one is common and less perfect, which is when you endeavor to resist some vice, sin, or temptation by means of acts of virtue, which conflict with this vice, sin, or temptation and destroy it. So if, for example, I'm conscious of the vice or temptation of impatience, or of the spirit of vengeance in my soul because of some harm which I have received, or some insulting words, I then resist it by means of some good meditation. For example, by the passion of our Lord, or by means of meditating upon the blessings which are acquired by suffering, or by thinking that God commanded that we should suffer, since suffering brings us profit. By means of such meditations, I am moved to suffer, accept and desire such insults, affronts, or evils as this for the glory and honor of God. This manner of resisting and fighting such temptation, vice, or sin begets the virtue of patience, and it is a good method of resistance, though it's difficult and less perfect. So what's he saying? All right, I got a vice, a temptation as attacking me over here. I'm going to... Attack it with an opposite virtue. Okay? I'm tempted to this. I'm going to concentrate my efforts over here to counteract it. So it's more like a horizontal tug of war in my soul. Now, let's listen to the other way. He says, there is another way of conquering vices and temptations and acquiring and gaining virtues that is easier, more profitable, and more perfect. When we feel the first movement or attack of any vice such as lust, wrath, impatience, or a vengeful spirit, we should not resist it by making an act of the contrary virtue in the way that we've just described. But as soon as we are conscious of this temptation, this thing that's attacking us, even if it be a devil... If we are conscious of it, when we're first conscious of it, we should meet it with an act or a movement of anagogical love directed against this vice. Anagogical love is just love that puts us at the end. That second window is heaven. It puts us right in heaven. An act of love that is anagogical is an act of love that puts us in the face of God at the end of our life. In heaven. This act of love should raise our affections to union with God. By this means, the soul absents itself from its surroundings and is present with its God and becomes united with Him as if He were already in heaven. Then the vice or the temptation and the enemy are defrauded of their intent and have nowhere to strike. Get a load of this. This is powerful. For the soul, being where it loves rather than where it lives, has met the temptation with divine aid. And the enemy has found nowhere to strike and nothing whereon to lay hold. For the soul is no longer where the temptation or enemy would have struck or wounded it. Ah, then, O marvelous thing, the soul having forgotten this movement of vice and being united and made one with its beloved no longer feels any movement of this vice wherewith the devil tempted, desired to tempt it and was succeeding in doing so. Maybe we felt the first movement of vengeance or something before we woke up and said, I'm getting out of here, I'm going to heaven. And the soul has escaped, St. John says, and is no longer present If it may be put this way, the devil is, as it were, tempting a dead body. 
and doing battle with something that is not, feels not, and is for the time being incapable of feeling temptation. Can you imagine that? Absenting yourself from an ugly situation. You're not escaping and running away. You're going straight to God. You're going to get the strength. You're going to laugh at it. You're going to crush Satan under your foot. How do I do this, Father? Well, here's a couple ideas. You say to yourself, what's this to all eternity? You start thinking about eternity. What's it like to be in front of God right now? What would I think about this particular action were I in front of him? You see, you're not fighting with an opposite virtue. You're going straight up. You're going vertical. You can stay and fight horizontal if you want. That's a tug of war. Go up. You'll win. St. John goes on to say, In this way there is begotten in the soul a wondrous and heroic virtue, a perfection which takes from it all concern about being praised or exalted or insulted or humbled or about whether men speak well of it or ill. Who cares? I don't care anymore because I love God and I'm with Him. Their truest effect upon the soul is to make it forget all things other than its beloved who is Jesus Christ. Thank you, St. John of the Cross. So how do we prevent our charity from growing cold? We must keep looking up. There's two windows, two ways to solve this problem. We grow in love through making sacrifices and uniting them with our Lord at the Mass, which we attend as much as possible. And when we can't attend, we spiritually unite ourselves. The more we attend the more he will draw us closer to himself into the supreme act of love, the passion of Christ, only to enter into the eternal act of love. That is heaven. He who dies with Christ will rise with Christ and live with him forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.